Welcome to another episode of Leonie chooses the wrong romance book to read. I think there are three unfortunate mistakes that led to this point. The first mistake is that I was born with the unfortunate tendency to always fall in love with the villain. I know many of us suffer from this cruel fate and I blame Zuko. So when I found a book with the following dedication to the girls who dream of meeting a prince but end up falling for the misunderstood villain I wrongfully assumed that that book would be great for me. That was my second mistake. And then the third and final mistake was seeing how popular this book is on TikTok, on Goodreads, seeing it in bookstores everywhere and assuming that that must mean that it might be good. I just thought how bad can it be? How bad can it be? Today we're talking about The Fine Print by Lauren Asher. This is in the category of billionaire romances. We'll talk about it. In this one our alpha male dominant love interest named Rowan is a billionaire because his family owns... well they don't give a name to it but it's basically Disney. It's Disney. And Rowan is the director of Dreamland. It's Disneyland. Dreamland is what I imagine would happen if you ordered Disneyland from Amazon. And its director, Rowan, is... <laughs> I guess what would happen if you like combined Walt Disney with Jeff Bezos <laughs> and then make him hot. <laughs> wow, I see you bussing that union over there. I think I have something else you can buy. <laughs> You know, every like alpha male love interest in a romance book always has some kind of conflict, some kind of big flaw that makes them human. You know what the big personal conflict is that Rowan, the love interest in the fine print, has to overcome? It's that he needs to learn to pay his employees a living wage and give them health care. I've been known to be demanding and clinical from forcing employees to work on Christmas Eve to swapping healthcare insurance policies to trim our bottom line. No amount of crying, moaning or yelling from our employees could convince me otherwise. And of course who better than to treat this billionaire basic human decency than our sunshiny girly main character. I won't tell you what her relation is to this billionaire yet, but you'll see. The book, by the way, starts with a playlist. I really don't like that so far having a playlist in the beginning of the book seems to be a premonition for the book being bad because I love the idea of authors adding playlists to their book. This playlist had no business being this good, including Cage the Elephant, Bastille, Abba Hosier, Arctic Monkeys, Fleetwood Mac, Taylor Swift. My expectations were quite high when I looked at this playlist. So we start in chapter one from the perspective of Rowan, our billionaire bad boy, and we are immediately hit with this beauty of the first sentence. The last time I attended a funeral, I ended up with a broken arm. The story made headlines after I threw myself into my mother's open grave. So the book starts with Rowan Kane being at his grandpa's funeral. Rowan is not grieving. He is not showing any tears. This is how he describes himself. I'm as tall as an NBA player with the emotional range of a rock. I have to appreciate the self-knowledge. He has no feelings, he is rich and he does not like polyester suits. When he was a child his mom died but just like right now he never showed his grief. I shut that part of my brain off once I realized no one could save me but myself. This man is very very emo. Zuko has got nothing on him. If everything I'm telling you about this book is starting to sound like noise, don't worry. Because I've got some great noise reducing earplugs to recommend to you because this video is sponsored by Loop. Loop creates all kinds of noise reducing earplugs which I love because they give me the freedom to do whatever I want without getting overstimulated by noise. For example yesterday I worked at the library and there I really want to focus and block out my surroundings so that's when I wear the Loop quiet line 
that is made for filtering out a lot of sound. But when I still want to hear something just a little less overwhelming, like at a concert, I wear the Loop Experience Plus. These are made for events and noise sensitivity. So Loop has an earplug for every situation and if you want to have the convenience of just three earplugs in one, you should check out the Loop Switch. With this one, I can switch between the different modes depending on how busy my environment is, taking noise control to a whole new level. All of Loop earplugs come in different colors so you can get one that fits your vibe. I carry my loops with me everywhere I go in my bag just in case. I highly recommend them. So if you also want to take control over the noise in your environment, make sure you click the link in my description. But the whole plot of this book starts when Rowan gets a letter from his grandpa that says that the grandpa put Rowan in his will. He's going to inherit a lot of money under one condition and that is that Rowan must become director of dream land and he has six months to make the park better. If he does not fulfill this, all the money will go to his father, Rowan's father, which he hates. He hates his father. But his father has given him some valuable advice. Rowan says, if there's one lesson we learned from my father, it is that love may come and go, but hate lasts forever. <laughs> I have a hard time imagining Rowan as this like dominant alpha male when he's being such a drama queen every single page. So he goes to his first meeting with his new employees as director, which he hates by the way. Dreamland might be in the business of selling fairy tales, but it brings me nothing but nightmares and bitter flashbacks. This man would hate Disney adults. But then when he's in his meeting, a girl walks in. Who is she? And why is she 20 minutes late? I take advantage of her distraction to assess her. She's beautiful in a way that makes it difficult to refocus my attention on the conversation. My eyes trace the curves of her body, drawing a path from her delicate throat to her thick thighs. The speed of my heart picks up. This woman is named Zara and by the fact that she is beautiful and the fact that she is wearing a quirky neon pink penny board with her, we can tell that she is going to be the love interest. So she stumbles in to this meeting because she's clumsy and her hand brushes past Rowan's lap, barely missing his car. Electricity shoots up my leg right to my crotch. So he's immediately lusting after her beauty, but he's very turned off by how happy she is because she is so quirky and he is so emo. Ah yes, the two genders, quirky sunshine woman and angry emo man in a suit. <laughs> now the kicker is that Zara works at Dreamland, making her Rowan's employee. Yes, this is a boss employee romance, which I don't have a problem with it itself, but <laughs> the basic conflict of this book is that Zara is really, really strong about workers' rights. Apparently, ever since Rowan is director, employees are given minimum wage, really bad healthcare, and that he has been leading them with what she calls a reign of terror. So the forbidden romance, hate to enemies to lovers part of this book is that Rowan exploits his employees and our female main character is an employee. Is this Jeff Bezos slash exploited employee fan fiction? So Rowan has a meeting with the higher ups and he is very clearly being one of those like nepotism babies that just swoops in, becomes the director of a company and just starts sharing random goals. And he's like, you have to start working harder. I want like the ROE of the company to go up by 5%. And all these employees that have been working there for very long are like, are you sure that's a good idea? I don't think that's gonna be possible. And then him, with like no experience is like, yep, yeah, you gotta do that. You gotta do as I say. He looks down so much on his employees and continuously refers to them as these like lowly employees that have no value to the company. 
And this is supposed to be our love interest? I'm supposed to find this man hot. This book made me decide to do the absolutely unthinkable and that is do a Joja farm run in Stardew Valley. I don't think I could ever get myself to do something that feels so awful in my mind, but this book inspired me to do so. Now we get the perspective of Zara and we get a little bit of her backstory. So she works at Dreamland as like a beautician, but she used to want to do design for all the roller coasters and stuff. And she had been working with her ex-boyfriend on this idea of a nebula land, but then her ex-boyfriend stole her idea that he gave Zara no credit for and it is now one of the biggest rides in Dreamland. She's kind of given up on her dreams to become a designer does she have any qualifications to be a theme park designer? Any background in architecture, engineering, drawing? Nope. That being said, I do think Zara kind of slays. She's really standing up for workers' rights all the time. I do feel bad that her ex-boyfriend stole her idea, so... What can I say? I'm actually kind of standing a little bit for Zara. Now, she makes a really, really big mistake. She gets drunk and writes an article tearing apart the Nebula Land ride, the one that Land stole her idea from and got turned into like a whole ride. She tears it apart in an article and accidentally submits it to Rowan. Now knowing how Rowan is leading Dreamland, he's described as an unethical tyrant and how people are constantly afraid of being laid off you would think she's probably gonna be laid off for this mistake, right? She gets a message from him the next day. Your presence is required at my office tomorrow at 8 a.m. sharp. So she comes into his office with her cherry red sneakers and puffy tool sleeves. The first thing she notices is how hot he is. The custom royal blue fabric hugs his body like someone sewed the material onto him. The materials highlight the dips and curves of every single muscle, like waves of water I want to drown in. Rowan is super hot because he's hot and he has muscles. One of my pet peeves in romance books is when authors are uncreative with describing why someone is hot. Like there are so many reasons why you could be attracted to someone beyond just big muscle man. <laughs> he says to her, your Nebula Land submission was rather bold. Not many people dare to critique a billion dollar investment. I submitted it while I was drunk, I blurt out. Anyway, this gets her a promotion because actually Rowan loved that she's going against establishment and this is not at all not in line with how he was previously established as this like tyrannical boss that doesn't care about anyone that doesn't do to his bidding but anyway she gets a job to be like a prestigious creator to imagineer rights for dreamland this is like her dream job again even though she has zero qualifications she gets the job and she has to work together with Rowan. We can see where this is going. They have to sign a contract and Zara is like, I'm not signing anything before I have the chance to read the fine print. They said the title. As any good main character of a romance novel, of course, Zara is obsessed with some English classic author. I can't help but feeling oddly attracted to Rowan's blunt nature. I blame my exposure to Pride and Prejudice at a young and impressionable age. And she also has many editions of Pride and Prejudice and has watched all the different movie iterations many times. She is also obsessed with this historical romance author called Juliana de la Rosa who wrote The Duke Who Seduced Me, which had been turned into a very popular TV adaptation. So it's Bridgerton. It, she's clearly talking about Bridgerton. And it's really making me feel like Zara is just an author stand-in. This is Rowan's reaction when he sees Zara, his like new employee, blush. I find her reactions to the simplest things interesting. What else would make her blush? An image of her red painted lips wrapped around something incredibly inappropriate flickers through my mind. HR? HR police? Jill, this man, please, 
he's right here. The next day is their first day of working together. We are in Zara's point of view. Rowan's body is nothing like my ex. Every inch of his lean body is packed with muscle like he runs for fun. He does. His muscular calves stick out from beneath the desk. What if jerks like Rowan are my kink? Well, at least it explains my unhealthy obsession with Mr. Darcy. Jane Austen, are you my guardian angel now? She is so quirky. She has to make a design for Rowan and Zara just keeps reminding us of how unqualified she is for this job. She's like, my skills seem on par with a two-year-old child learning how to hold a crane for the first time. Then why did you give her the job? Well, drawing talent or not, she has to present her ideas to the whole group, which of course includes Rowan, since he's the director. Today he wears a grey suit that has my mouth watering and my thighs pressing together. The charcoal colour brings out the severity in his gaze. His muscles shift under luxurious fabric as he settles into the chair at the front of his room. I am just confused as to why this man keeps wearing suits that are clearly too small for him. For a man that won't even consider wearing a polyester suit, he also clearly cannot be bothered to get a suit fitted. Rowan asks her to also show the drawings that she makes and Zara's like, no, I'm not gonna do that. And he's like, you have to listen to me, show the drawings. She shows the drawings and he's like, um, your drawings could use some work. And because she was not obedient to him, he says, everyone is dismissed except for Miss Julian. This is some see me after class type stuff. If you talk to me like that in front of everyone again. Um, let me guess, you'll fire me? It's a bit predictable for my taste, but I respect it since you're the man in charge. This is like my first big pet peeve with this book. The book really tries to touch on how bosses can mistreat their employees, but it completely ignores the power dynamic that exists between bosses and employees. How so much trouble in the workplace rises because employees are a little afraid to go against their bosses because bosses create this culture, this tyrannical culture, where employees are constantly afraid that they'll get fired, which Zara points out. But then throughout the entire book, she's being sassy like this, saying things like, let me guess, you'll fire me? Oh, that's so predictable of you. She's saying things like, I know you're my boss, but you you can't tell me what to do. I feel like it's sassiness like that that completely ignore the power differences between bosses and employees that this book tries superficially to critique. Anyway, she's like, I bet you'll fire me. And he's like, there are worse things that I'm capable of, like, I don't think you want to find out. You better have a massive dick to back up that attitude or else people will be mighty disappointed. Care to bring out a ruler and test your theory? All of these people need to call HR. Are you always this impossible, he says. I don't know, are you always this much of an asshole? One second he's scowling at me and the next his lips are slamming into mine? This is page 80. There needs to be a special jail for people like this. And they're both like, oh God, we really shouldn't have done that. That was really bad. We really shouldn't have done that. But you know, they're still together because they're working together. His heavy gaze smacks into me, knocking the air from my lungs. This book, by the way, is full of like really weird visuals like that. So Rowan is like, Zara, you can't draw, <laughs> but you need to make drawings for your design. So I'll have someone else make the drawings for you. Again, <laughs> why not hire someone that can draw? Maybe that's a good idea if you're a designer. But anyway, but he actually has a secret and that is that he is secretly making these drawings for her It's not someone else because Rowan has a passion for arts He just doesn't do it anymore because his father wouldn't let him I'm sweating out my demons one stroke of the pencil at a time Drawing is a useless hobby Real men don't draw <laughs> So Rowan is basically what would happen if you ordered Troy Bolton from Amazon. Except having to choose between basketball and singing, Rowan has to choose between drawing and being a billionaire. Those two things cannot go together. Drawing is for women. 
as if most architects or mechanical artists aren't men. The next day he drops his drawing off by Zara but pretends it's from someone else. The fact that they kissed and realized that that was kind of a bad thing to do because of the boss employee thing does not stop him from thinking things like this. The soft skin is meant to entice, to kiss and mark while she's f***ed into oblivion. There are plenty of things I'd want to do to that pretty little neck given the chance. Ugh. But he can't because it's dangerous because she might claim she won't report me to HR But I haven't made it this far in life by trusting anyone but myself Her options are endless and she has every opportunity to squeeze money out of me like a wet rag The media alone could pay for her to retire at the whopping age of 23 Yes, because pressing assault charges is something that has historically gone so well for women in the office. I hate that this book is perpetuating this false idea that pressing charges is just something women can so easily do to just like get some quick money out of someone. Anyway, because Zara is still like a queen for workers rights. She's like, I want to thank the artist who made this drawing for me. Can I please get this person's number? But you know, Rowan can't tell her that he made the drawing because real men don't draw. He gives her his number, but like pretends he's this guy named Scott who makes her drawings. And they continue to have this like texting back and forth that basically feels like if you asked ChatGPT to write a generic sunshine grumpy romance. Are you this hopeful about everything? Sure, why not? Because life isn't always rainbows and sunshine. Of course not, but how can we appreciate the sun every morning if we don't live through the dark? And Rowan continues to be interested in Zara because she doesn't fit in. Everything about her is strange, from her vintage attire to her pins. She doesn't fit in, into the usual neat category of business professionals I'm used to. But he will never fall in love with Zara, because when his father fell in love with his mom, and then his mom died, his father became like an alcoholic, a tyrant, became super abusive to him and his brothers. So he only knows love as something that will like turn a man into a horrible person. It's that the useless emotion makes people weak and powerless. It clouds judgment and has the opportunity to ruin everything. He is such a drama queen. This is what Rowan says to his employees a little while later. Until further notice, employees will be expected to work 12-hour days to increase productivity and creativity. Will we receive a pay raise? Am I supposed to reward you all for being average? <laughs> this is the man we're supposed to root for? It's what makes him a misunderstood villain? No, I can excuse a hot villain that kills people, but I draw the line at employee exploitation. But then he finds out that Zara has been working late and not sleeping. His quirky girl that he's obsessed with because she wears vintage clothes is not sleeping because of the insane working hours that he put on her. And suddenly he's like, oh no. She has to take care of herself. I, this is horrible. He also finds out that Zara is working a second job tutoring kids. Zara says, I do this as a favor for a single mom I used to work with. Why? Because she works a second job and can't afford a tutor herself, so I offered to help. For free? <laughs> This man would love Andrew Tate. But why does she need to work two jobs? To which Zara replies that the Dreamland wages aren't enough for everyone to live off. This gives Rowan a sinking feeling in his heart. <sighs> Is this me starting to care? Whoa, empathy? <laughs> then he pulls out the classic, if they're so unhappy with their job, 
why don't they just quit? And he just keeps going on about how little he cares for his employees. I've been known to be demanding and clinical, from forcing employees to work on Christmas Eve, to swapping healthcare insurance policies to trim our bottom line. No amount of crying, moaning, or yelling from our employees could convince me otherwise. But Zara somehow got under my skin. <laughs> Her calm and collected conversation about the employee's finances actually got to me. Obviously, I agree with the message, but why is this the quirky plot of a romance story? A self-described misunderstood villain romance story. I think he's not misunderstood. I'm understanding this man very well. Anyway, he starts talking to one of the employees asking her why she's working two jobs and she's like, because my husband has a heart condition and his medication costs more than a monthly mortgage. He was diagnosed at 45 after our grandchild passed. <laughs> and then Rowan is like, I pinched a bridge of my nose. Something about Martha working late into the night on a shitty ankle because I don't pay her enough doesn't sit right with me. Treating people like garbage is bad, Rowan. And so he decides to give the woman like an early Christmas bonus and she faints. Her eyes roll into her, the back of her head as she passes out. Fuck. This is why I don't do nice things. Also, in case you forget that this is a Sunshine Grumpy romance, the author will constantly remind you by adding little lines like this everywhere. Zara's like the sun, with everyone orbiting around her to bask in her warmth. Unlike me, who keeps people away from me with nothing but a scowl. Rowan decides to take all the employees on a research day where they basically just spend a day in the Dreamland theme park, which of course opens up the playing field for many scenes where Rowan and Zara have to sit next to each other, you know, in a little, in a little cart and then, ooh, maybe, maybe their legs touch a little bit. Why can't you leave me alone? Zara croaks. Okay, maybe leave her alone then. She is scooting away from him very clearly so they don't touch. So Zara doesn't want anything to do with him even though she thinks he's so hot because he's her boss and she's his employee and she does kind of slay a little bit. She has common sense and she's like, let's not do that. Imagine everything else, the next scenes that I'm going to be presenting to you as if this wasn't a romance novel, okay? Just appraise it for what it is without like genre expectations, okay? So at this point she's already scooted away from him and yelled at him, why won't you leave me alone? She's leaving by herself because she's like, I'm gonna check out the other rides by myself. I'm coming along. Why? Because I find you interesting. <laughs> they go on this thrilling roller coaster together. Why are you really spending so much time with me? Don't you have other things to do and people to torment? Valid point, by the way. This man is supposed to be like working 100 hour weeks and he's just constantly around her somehow. Maybe I enjoy hearing your screams. <laughs> Rowan's POV, she has the magnetism of the Bermuda Triangle and I'm a lost plane desperate to land. They're talking about how Zara's ex used to call her fat. Seriously, what kind of idiot complains about a woman having curves? Off the record, your body is hot as f <laughs> Get him to HR, please. We shouldn't be having this conversation. You're my boss. I'm not technically your boss. And, and he tries to pull on her the logic that um, Jenny is Zara's boss and he is Jenny's boss. So technically he's not Zara's boss. He's just, you know, the super, super higher up, most highest boss of all. That's worse. That, that's actually worse. That's worse. Zara coming in again with the common sense. Well, you're my boss's boss, which means I should definitely not bring up my ex to you. So be a gentleman and shut up. Okay, thanks. Gentle is the last thing I wanna be around you. 
You're cute when you get all flustered. Like right after she told you that you're her boss and she doesn't want to do this, you're saying stuff like this? This is not some cute forbidden love boss employee thing. This is jail time. The only romance I want to see is between Rowan and like the bars of his prison. She stumbles and falls into his arms. Her eyes hold mine hostage. Weird visual. I grab onto the strand and tuck it behind her ear. I cup her cheek and then our lips crash together. My growing erect is poorly restrained by my slacks and Zara gasps. Go on a date with me. Guys, if a girl tells you why you can't leave her alone, constantly scoots away from you and constantly points out to you that you're her boss and she's your employee and so it's not right, does that mean you should leave her alone or or kiss her and ask her on a date. I really don't know, guys. Please tell me. <laughs> Reddit. <laughs> Zara's reaction to all of this is the exact same as my reaction. What? Should I repeat myself? No. <laughs> Do you need a bigger reason besides the fact that you're my boss? You are right, girl. Her words throw me back into the past of the boy who was rejected until he learned to stop caring. <laughs> no, you are not allowed to play the victim right now. I'm sorry, but your daddy issues do not absolve you from being a creep. That's what Freud said, actually. But she stands up for herself. She's like, you're nothing but a jerk who gets off on making everyone as miserable as you. He realizes he messed up. I feel as foolish as motherfucker. Mr. Darcy. <laughs> Anyhow, for some reason he decides that a few days later is like the perfect time to reveal to her that he is actually Scott. Probably because he thinks that maybe then she will go on a date with him. There is no Scott. I'm the one who's been texting you all this time. I don't know why he thought this would go well for him because Zara is obviously like, oh my gosh, he's a liar. I'm leaving. We're done here. That's it. I deserve an opportunity to explain myself and make it up to you. Are you for real? You deserve nothing but a courtesy hello whenever we pass each other in the hallway. She's so real for saying that. So far this just feels like a book about a very cool assertive woman that has to like stand up for herself to get rid of this like annoying weirdo workplace harasser that also wears suits that are way too small. So she is making it super super clear she doesn't want anything to do with him. She even decides that she is going to find another job. But of course Rowan is just like you're not quitting. I dumped the job resignation in the trash under her desk. I make sure my fingers skim her body. Her soft inhale of breath tells me everything. Zara is attracted to me. Because when someone sharply inhales a breath when you touch them, that always definitely means that they're attracted to you and not at all ever could that mean that they're really scared right now. He starts begging Zara like, please give me another chance, please don't leave, let me make it up to you, please. And Zara, after saying no a gazillion times, finally breaks and is like, okay, I'll give you one more try. That is their dynamic. It's not just a boss employee thing. Like I understand the appeal of the boss employee romance. I know like the point of so many forbidden romances is that they are kind of taboo. I totally understand that. I'm not gonna sit here and be like, that's so problematic because like it's supposed to be a little taboo. That's why it's the fantasy. The power dynamic that makes a boss employee thing in real life kind of wrong is what makes it exciting for a fantasy in a romance novel. That could work for a romance novel that's, if that's what you're going for, you know, kind of playing with that power dynamic. <laughs> but this book just has zero acknowledgement of the power dynamic that exists. The reason why boss employee things are, you know, problematic in real life, I don't think I have to explain, but it's because a boss holds power over their employee. That's why if you're a boss, you can't just go around kissing your employees or asking them on a date because 
What if when they say yes, it's actually because they're afraid you might lay them off otherwise? This book does not acknowledge that at all. It even goes so far as having this main character that does constantly say no and the boss just like he just row just keeps going like that's weird if it wasn't a boss employee thing but because it's a boss employee thing it's even weirder but it is a truth universally acknowledged that a creepy man with a sad backstory cannot be a creep which we get when they go on a date now rowan's story is that he's not just a jerk he's a sad jerk and there's nothing in life worse than being a jerk who is also sad he tells zara i used to love drawing why did you stop i used to love drawing but my dad never understood that he liked to throw a ball around i'd rather draw that ball it's really sad See, that's why he's a selfish billionaire now. He treats people like garbage and ruins their life by taking away their health care. But it's just because his dad took away his crayons. We must have empathy for him because behind every billionaire, there is a sad boy who couldn't follow his dreams and now is stuck with billions of dollars. I lost my virginity while unknowingly being filmed with a hidden camera. It actually is pretty bad. Basically, he's talking about how people are constantly blackmailing him or trying to use him for his money. And here we get, I think, one of the most bizarre lines in the book. This is Zara's inner monologue because she realizes now that I thought money meant security, but realistically, it only further complicates life. Being poor is hard because, you know, you constantly have to fear for your life and your health and the well-being of your loved ones. But being rich is actually also really hard because sometimes you can't trust people. <laughs> So given his backstory, we now understand why Rowan was afraid to be close to Zara because he was afraid that she was gonna use him for his money. That's why he pretended to be Scott. And Zara instantly softens up to him. He might have lied, but his intentions behind continuing the fantasy are so sad that I want to cry for him. <laughs> He's sad, so it's okay that he lied to me. Having daddy issues doesn't cause you to exploit employees. If that was the case, half the romance reading community <laughs> would be on trial for workplace misconduct. Good thing Rowan is such a romantic. You like me? Zara says. No, I tolerate you more than most people. That's why I want to date you. To which Rowan says, I'm not a cheater, and while I lied to you about everything before, I won't do it anymore. That I can assure you. I know I lied to you about everything so far, but I won't do that anymore. You can trust me. But I'll prove it to you, Rowan says. How so? Would you rather me show or tell you? In my notes, I wrote down, Oh no, are they gonna have sex now? <laughs> they are. Our lips fuse together as we kiss like never before. I just imagine those like cartoon characters when they try to lick something made of ice and it just like sticks to their tongue. That's the visual I'm getting here. Two tongues dueling against one another for dominance. I'm getting the very strong suspicion that the author started out writing fanfiction or has read a lot of fanfiction. So basically them going to have sex is somehow him proving to her that he won't lie to her again. We all know that when a man has sex with you, that is a, a good sign that he will not lie to you anymore. <laughs> We all know that. Well-known fact. So the smut scenes, in my opinion, are very, very boring, um, but they do sometimes have banger lines like, take a man out to dinner first. Does my pussy count? <laughs> I laugh as I lean over her and prop myself on my elbows. And I just imagine this man being like, <laughs> like that. <laughs> just swinging his little feet like this. So they shared their sad backstories, they slept together, they resolved the problem around Scott. Why are we only halfway throughout the book? 
what 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 else is going to happen what what other conflicts could still arise well they decide to keep it casual and that's how you know war is about to break out i'm taking you out tomorrow for a date don't you think you should ask me first i don't ask questions i know the answer to Ugh. if a man ever said that to me i would run away zara says she can't meet him tomorrow night because she has a team meeting to which he says good thing you have an in with your boss no way that's an abuse of power it is what's the point of having all this power if i don't use it in any way so this book started out rightfully criticizing how he abuses the power that he has as a boss but now that they're together she is like actively reaping the benefits of it and like him abusing said power is used for the romance it's basically she says no but the plot says yes she is constantly going against him abusing his power as her boss but it does still happen it's still used to create romantic moments like him getting her out of a meeting so he can take her out to dinner so that you as a reader can still enjoy the fantasy the book realizes that you're not supposed to want to date your boss you're not supposed to want your boss to abuse his power to help you we know that that is unethical so our main character says it's unethical but it does happen so to use the reader can enjoy the fantasy without the shame of wanting that fantasy this is actually a pattern that you see in a lot of romance books in young adult fantasy it used to be like very common for a main character to be like i don't need a man i don't need any romance i'm not interested in men but then the story gives them a hot prince anyway you know the story gives them a romance anyway a lot of those like not like other girl characters back in the day would say that they don't like curly things they don't like like pretty fashion and clothes and stuff but they will get some kind of makeover scene or like a scene where they have to wear a pretty dress so that as the reader you can still enjoy that fantasy of becoming pretty and girly uh, while still being able to relate to a character that doesn't want that like we may understand that desiring this like very dominant rich man to take care of you may maybe perpetuate some gender roles that we no longer agree with but we haven't really gotten rid of the desire to be taken care of by like a rich man that does everything for you and because something is perceived wrong that just makes the desire stronger <laughs> nowadays we know the unethical nature of billionaires the wealth and equality of it all and we're more aware of like the real world problems of bosses that don't treat their workers right so here we get a modern billionaire romance that tries to acknowledge those issues we get a main character that constantly calls out the billionaire's messy behavior he is slowly learning empathy because of her she can fix him but while criticizing it we still get the billionaire dating lifestyle there's gonna be so many scenes of him like taking her on like super expensive dates flying her over across the country things like that he's constantly paying for her dinner even though she will say that she doesn't want him to do that he's pulling strings at her in the company even though she says that that's wrong to do no wonder that this series is so popular because it gives you the billionaire romance without the guilt of wanting the billionaire romance if we got a main character that instead was like well i know he's my boss but he's hot so i'm going for it many readers might maybe think like oh that's that feels unethical so instead we got zara who constantly tells him no no this is wrong i'm standing up for workers rights but then it happens anyway it's a more guilt-free way of enjoying a fantasy that you deep down might believe to be wrong i totally understand why this is so popular i'm not here to tell anyone that it's wrong to like a billionaire romance or to enjoy this fantasy of this like 
alpha male man taking care of you. Like, it's not my thing, but I understand that what you want in your romance book does not have to reflect what you want in real life. I understand that. It's just such a shame that I feel like Lauren Asher, by trying to address these problems of the boss employee thing and trying to address how wrong it is. She created a story where a woman continuously says no and a man just keeps chasing her and it makes him seem like a massive creep. For me, it made reading this book extremely uncomfortable. Maybe it's really weird for me to say it, but I think I would have enjoyed this book more. It would have been more of just like a shameless fantasy if the main character was just like, I know he's my boss and it's wrong, but I'm just going for it. I think I would, that, that would be fun. <laughs> I don't know. Let me know what, what you think of it all. Let's continue because we were only halfway and they are dating casually. He takes her on like a surprise date in an airplane. Turns out they're going to New York City and he like organized a book event for her where she gets to meet like her favorite author Juliana de la Rosa aka Julia Quinn and of course Zara and this author immediately get along amazingly and they're like instantly best friends uh, he takes her to like a fancy hotel penthouse it's just it's a little boring. It feels like serialized fan fiction. You know those fan fiction where the story doesn't really go anywhere, it's just your comfort characters doing fun little dates together, except these aren't my comfort characters, they're my discomfort characters. Also in case you didn't catch yet that this book was written for the people who love villains and morally gray heroes. My life went full-blown dreamland princess in less than an hour. But instead of a prince on a horse, I ended up with Rowan, the perfect kind of morally gray hero I love reading about. We get more backstory from both of them, uh, lest we forget that Rowan is very sad because he's rich. He's telling Zara about his multiple homes that he has and she's like, wow, what is it like to have more money than God? It's lonely. He's so sad because he has a lot of money. And now we finally get the whole of Zara's story. We find out that Zara has been going to therapy a lot for her depression. Rowan is confused by this. But you're... What? I'm nice? Happy? Smiling? Why would anyone who's happy go to therapy? Everyone has bad times. You know, I do like what this book is trying to do. It's a sunshine grumpy romance, but here it's really trying to show that the sunshine characters aren't always happy. That you can't always tell when someone is depressed. Even though it is told in the most under-nose manner, I still appreciate the message. So now they both share their sad backstories, they're super in love. Honestly, it really reminds me of when I watch reality TV. Like, I don't know if any of you have seen Love is Blind, but in reality TV shows, sometimes you see these two people seemingly having an open and honest conversation about their past with someone for the first time in their lives and immediately are like, wow, this person is my soulmate. I'm getting to know someone beyond exteriors for the first time in my life. I must marry this person. That's what I feel is happening between Zara and Rowan. And all the smut scenes still feel like you trained an AI on fanfiction and just asked it to roll out like the most cliche lines. Together we're a raging inferno. I'm scared that I'll burst into flames if I touch him. It's fitting seeing how falling for Rowan is like playing with fire. The story is still not over. We have a hundred pages left still. What could go wrong? Well, this is where the story just truly... I truly just lost it at this. So he takes Zara out to experience snow for the first time because she's never seen snow. Every time she smiles, he has a mini orgasm. I drag my thumb back and forth across her frozen skin. Damn, my balls have officially become a prisoner of war. So playing in the snow has kind of made Zara come down with a cold. Rowan decides to take care of her. 
He says, my house tonight, 6 p.m. You're leaving work early? He's taking a night off to take care of her because he can just do that and we're just kind of like neatly ignoring the fact that he wanted all his employees to work 12 hour days but he's constantly taking time off so he's taking care of her but she's just not getting better. She says, I'm pretty sure my sinuses make up three-fourths of my brain by now and my left nostril hasn't felt fresh oxygen since yesterday. I cough again but this one doesn't stop. My chest rattles from the sheer intensity of it. There's a sharp stabbing pain poking me in the lungs and it takes every ounce of my energy to breathe. Something's going on here. So she goes to sleep and the next day there's a doctor by her bed. She's been sick for three days straight already. In my professional opinion, she needs to be taken to a hospital. She's severely dehydrated and needs proper medical care. Shift to Rowan's perspective. I bolt up the stairs and throw open the bedroom door at the end of the hall. The pulse point at my neck throbs at a wickedly fast beat as I walk into the empty bedroom. The sheets are nothing but a haphazard mess, empty of the severely ill woman who should be sleeping. I don't think, I don't breathe. I'm pretty sure a piece of my frozen heart shatters right off. Another drop splatters against her face, trickling down into the blood trail. It takes me a second to realize the water is coming from me. My tears. He calls 911 and she is taken to the hospital. Zara turns out to have pneumonia, which could be lethal. And this is when the realization hits Rowan. I willingly became like my father, giving in to a woman's every whim until they took over all my thoughts and influenced my actions. I've rearranged my schedule, took nights off and went on vacation when I should have been working. I became soft and easily swayed by her. He decides that he must immediately stop loving her because it's bad for him and he's gonna be like his father. So cute, lots of miscommunication. But of course he can't just let her die so he goes to the hospital with her and there he is like, I demand a private room for her. To which the nurse says, once she's stabilized, that's up to her insurance policy. My jaw clenches down. I have no idea what kind of insurance Zara is on, let alone if they allow for private rooms. And then he realizes he's Zara's boss. So that means she has the horrible insurance plans he gave his employees. So now he can't give her a private room. When Zara wakes up, they have this messed up conversation. How many days have I been out to? That all sounds so expensive. The only thing you need to worry about is getting better. That's easy for you to say. I can't afford my deductible or whatever it costs to have oxygen therapy and overnight hospital stays. Oh, sorry, that was so messed up. I just fainted, passed out, and now I have to continue filming the next day. And it's definitely not because my camera battery died. So we have the messed up situation where she's worried about her medical bills because her boss, aka her love interests, doesn't give her enough health care. But it's fine because he pays for it. If he wasn't in love with her and willing to pay for her, she could have died. I don't know what's supposed to be romantic about this. So he's acting super cold to her because remember, he just remembered that love is the mind killer. But Sara, of course, calls him out on his rude behavior. Cut the bullshit, Rowan. What is your problem? We were supposed to be something casual, something fun. This isn't even close to what I want or need in my life. People are depending on me and I'm stuck making sure you're okay because I feel responsible. I never asked to play your dutiful boyfriend. Yikes! She's kind of taken aback by the fact that he's calling on the fact that they decided to keep it casual and she's like, sure, we might not have had an official label, but I really thought we had something special. Oh, you know, that's where a lot of us go wrong. Many such cases, Zara. Many such cases. So they're staying apart for a few days and Rowan is like struggling with himself. He's afraid that he will become just like his father. But then he remembers the words of his mother. His mother used to tell him when he was a child, 
show kindness in all your actions. Everything I did was at the expense of others, while everything my mother did was based on her love and compassion. A wave of regret hits me all at once. I allow myself to come to terms with the monster I became. I don't know why the entire book long he was like, I don't want to be like my father. My father is horrible. I never want to be like him. And then only now at the end of the book, he suddenly remembers, oh, then maybe that means I should listen to my mother. So overnight, he has suddenly fixed his daddy issues because he remembers the words of his mom and also Zara was nice to him. So it's a classic case of man learning empathy because woman in his life. Rowan tries to get Zara back and she continues to be a queen and is like, I've been through enough and honestly, I deserve better than anything that you could half-heartedly offer me. That's right. So again, Zara quits. She puts in her two week notice and I think we all know Rowan well enough by now to know that he doesn't let that happen. You can't quit. She continues to just spit facts. I have no reason to believe you're anything but selfish. You choose to think about one person and one person only and that's yourself. And she's so right to think this. Leave the man and be free. He keeps trying after she's continuously said no. He goes to her house on Christmas Eve being like, I have a gingerbread house. Let's make a gingerbread house together. I'm sure that will make up for all the horrible things that I've done. You think a gingerbread house is going to make things better? Zara says. So the day of the vote comes around. Rowan has to present his ideas to make Dreamland better. And if the people vote for him, he will make Dreamland better and he will get his grandpa's inheritance. Now what is Rowan's plan? He starts this whole speech about how he has completely changed up his plan. He's talking about how Zara got to him. This person showed me how money becomes meaningless. We ignore the very people who help us make a profit. I began interviewing employees at random from all departments. There are hundreds of stories from people struggling to work two jobs to employees being unable to afford appropriate health care. No person should have to choose between supporting their family or putting their medical needs first. And he's giving all of his employees a 50% raise at the least. Wow, look at Rowan solving poverty. He also has a whole plan on making the park more disability friendly. There, by the way, was like a whole plot line that I kind of skipped over, but I do want to mention because honestly, it was like the one thing that I really enjoyed about this book is that Zara is also really standing up for disability rights. She has a sister with Down syndrome. Um, that also plays a big role in this book. She's honestly a really cute and like fun character. And she keeps advocating for the park to be more accessible for anyone with disabilities. And now Rowan has listened to her and it, it made it part of his plan. It's genuinely nice. It's just insane to me that the whole plot of this book is that the love interest had to learn to not exploit his employees. Like, I agree with the message, but is that your love interest? Is this your man? Look at the page. Is this your man? So Zara obviously votes for his plan. Everyone votes go and the plan goes through. She forgives him because he's changed now. You may think that now finally he has learned to treat his employees like anything more than little dogs. Well, there's a moment where he's talking to his brothers and one of his brothers, Declan, is going to get like an increased workload. Rowan suggests Iris could help you with some of the workload, to which the third brother counters, Rowan, we're supposed to protest against Iris working more hours. Poor girl probably forgot what the sun looks like with all the hours Declan makes her work. So clearly an overworked and not treated well employee. And Rowan is just like, I don't care about Iris or her schedule so long as I get what I want. I will never stop being greedy when it comes to Zara. 
She will always be the exception to any rule and the one person I'm willing to screw the world over for. So they try to do the whole I will burn down the world for you trope thing, which I'm already not really a fan of, but especially in this context, it's bizarre. Because it basically shows that he's learned nothing. Now the message of the book is, it's bad to be a tyrannical billionaire that treats his employees like dirt, but if you're doing it to help your girl, then it's hot, actually. I feel like we just spent the entire book establishing that treating your employees like that is wrong, but now we're supposed to swoon when he treats employees wrong to help Zara? Also, another example that he has learned nothing. Remember that Zara put in her two weeks notice? I didn't let Jenny file your notice, so you're still considered an employee in every way that counts. What? I sit up. I couldn't let you go. Don't you just love it when your billionaire boyfriend at the ripe age of 30 year old just learned the concept of empathy and now immediately abuses his power so you can't get away from him. And Zara's like, I don't, I think it's illegal to not let me quit. To which he says, well, according to your contract, I can do exactly that until you complete an exit interview with me. That's why you always check the fine print. Oh, that's the police. They're coming. Coming to get him. Probably for tax fraud as well, wouldn't be surprised. Well, this is our happy ending. They get married. It makes Zara feel amazing. My entire heart dissolves in my chest. I don't think any type of healthcare can help you with that, I'm afraid. Zara's original idea of Nebuland gets created, they have children, whatever. And that's the book. <sighs> but let me know what you thought. Again, I understand the appeal of like the whole billionaire, rich man who will take care of you thing. I understand it. It's just not for me. If you want to read a good book with me, consider joining my Patreon so you get access to my book club. All I can do is thank my patrons for allowing me to do weird little videos like this one with a special shout out to all of my elite Patreon members. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you soon with another video very soon. Goodbye.